our July Mornings on Maine webinar series. Um, just want to remind everybody that you are coming in uh, muted and uh, no cameras. Uh, this is a webinar format. Um, we do want participation though, and that uh, there's a Q&A portion that uh, we'll have at the end of this presentation. And so you can put your questions in the box of the Q&A box and I'll uh, moderate those for Allison as we move through it. Um, also, you can change the functionality from your phone to your computer if you need to, if you're having technical difficulties, and every so often I have to do that from, from my vantage point. Uh, feel free to do that, and directions would be in your control panel um, as we get started. And if we don't get to any question, if we don't get to all the questions for some reason, you can email us and there's a, an email address there on the screen, send those emails, uh, or you can uh, just reply to your reminder email and that will come to me and uh, I can answer any of those questions or forward them on to Allison. All right, well, let's get started. Um, we have a topic today on historic preservation. And I was thinking about this this morning, getting ready that uh, while we celebrated preservation month in May, we are, we are pulling it into June and July. <laughs> um, we have had a lot of preservation topics and just wanted to keep that flowing with bringing in Allison. And she's gonna talk about historic preservation funding in your community. And she is with Missouri Parks. And uh, Allison, I am going to unshare my screen so you can start sharing and we're going to get started. All right. Sounds good. Okay. Can everybody see the screen? All right. Perfect. Awesome. Okay, great. Well, um, hello everyone out there. Um, my name is Allison Archambault and I am a grants manager with Missouri State Parks. I work in the grants management section in the grants recreation and interpretation program, which is division of Missouri State Parks, the Department of Natural Resources. Sorry about that. And so today we are going to, I'm sorry about this. Let's see, here we go. Today we are going to, let's see, there we go. I give an, plan to give an overview and provide highlights about the other grant programs offered from Missouri State Parks, but the focus is really gonna be on historic preservation. In the future, there will be a grant application workshop for the Historic Preservation Fund that will cover the application process and we'll have time for more conversation and discuss specific projects. But today, what the goal is to understand the Historic Preservation Fund source of funding, the grant requirements, and of course, I'm going to give you a little bit of a history lesson because I can't go without that, um, and then talk about some of the program requirements. And then we'll discuss the types of projects that are eligible for funding from the Historic Preservation Fund. And then the other other funding opportunities we'll talk about are the Land and Water Conservation Fund, the Recreational Trails Program, and the Outdoor Legacy Recreation Partnership, which is called ORLAP. And that one actually is open right now for applications. So we'll discuss that one in just a few moments. The next, so first off, let's talk about some history. It's time for a history lesson. In 1966, Congress passed the National Historic Preservation Act. The law was designed to establish a program for the identification and protection of historic properties in the United States. Essentially, it is the first piece of real legislation that made historic preservation a responsibility of the federal government. One component of the act was the creation of state historic preservation offices who those in each state, they were then mandated to carry out the responsibilities of the act. Missouri was certified as a SHPO in 1968. The State Historic Preservation Office here in Missouri has been funding historic preservation projects in local communities since 1971, which is about 50 years ago, if anyone's keeping track. Um, but and the one item that I find really interesting about the funding source is that it comes from doesn't come from tax revenue. Instead, it is revenue due and payable to the United States under Section 9 of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. So in other words, it's mitigation for offshore oil leasing. Each year, the funds are deposited into the Historic Preservation Fund for the protection of our country's rich heritage. So the Historic Preservation Fund is used to support 
the all state historic preservation offices in the United States and the US territories. A few months ago, I believe in April, Tony Prawl, who is the deputy state historic preservation office provided an extensive overview of Missouri's state historic preservation office. Today, I'm just gonna give a brief highlight as a reminder in case anybody missed that presentation. So in Missouri, the state historic preservation office is part of the Department of Natural Resources, which is in the division of Missouri State Parks. It is an agency that is mandated to carry out the responsibilities of the National Historic Preservation Act. The State Historic Preservation Office has several primary functions to review and assist with the nomination of properties to the National Register of Historic Places, conducting and helping the public conduct architectural surveys, protecting architectural or archaeological resources, and then reviewing federal undertakings pursuant to section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act to determine what the impact of federally funded projects will be on historic properties. They also review state and federal tax credit rehabilitation applications to ensure they're in keeping with the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties certifying local governments as an official partner in preservation, offering matching grants to accomplish preservation goals, and last but not least, educating the public about historic preservation and providing technical assistance. So a lot of you have probably heard about certified local governments. So what about those certified local governments? So the certified local government program is a partnership between the federal, state, and local governments. And to become a certified local government, you must meet several requirements, including enactment of a historic preservation ordin ordinance, establishment of a qualified preservation commission, and a few other requirements as well. Interestingly, the certified local government program was not part of the original act. This program was added in 1980 in an amendment to the National or to the Historic Preservation Act. So that amendment provides local governments an avenue for active participation in this federal preservation program. Each year, Congress appropriates funding to the National Park Service. The National Park Service is re responsible for allocating an apportionment of funding to each state. In turn, the state of Missouri then subgrants these federal dollars directly to communities for historic preservation purposes. The act mandates that we give 10% of each state's allocation to certified local governments, which is why you might hear this program, the Historic Preservation Fund grants, referred to as the CLG or Certified Local Government Grants Program. So what does it mean to have 10% mandated pass through? So I've created a general example for this demonstration purpose. This are not real numbers, but generally an idea. So Congress appro appro I'm sorry, appropriated and the NPS apportioned $1 million to the state of Missouri to carry out its duties. 10% of that is $100,000. This is the funding that is required to go to certified local governments. However, in Missouri, we typically grant additional funds beyond the requirement. In this example, the total grant budget is $225,000. The first thing that we do is to make sure that we are meeting our mandated 10% to certified local government partners. After the certified local government applications are selected, then all other eligible applicants, which might include additional CLGs, are then eligible to compete for the remaining funds equally. If you're interested in learning more about the CLG program, I'd recommend taking a look at the requirements listed on the State Historic Preservation Office's website. There is no guarantee in the future that the budget would allow for additional funding beyond the required 10%. So the CLG program is the only way your community will always be eligible for, to compete for these funds. So how does the funding work for this historic preservation grant? So it's a quick explanation about how this grant funding works. It is a 60-40 matching share grant, meaning that the federal government reimburses 60% of the project costs and the applicant matches 40%. There's not a requirement the matching share has to be cash. Other types of match can be considered. For instance, the donation of time, materials, a venue space, equipment use, all of these things can be considered match. Know that this also is a reimbursement grant though. So it means that you have to incur the cost or the community has to incur the cost before you can be reimbursed for it. So that means that you have to pay the contractor and have an invoice and proof of payment to document the expense and then request a reimbursement back from the federal government. 
through our office. Um, and in an effort to ensure the widest distribution as possible, grants are generally not more than $50,000. All right, it's rule time. Who's ready for some rules? So the Historic Preservation Fund is a grant from the federal government. And with that, there's associated rules. Accepting funds from the federal government means that you have to follow to CFR 200, which is the uniform administrative requirements, cost principles, and auto requirements for federal awards. Basically, these are the rules that outline how federal, how you would utilize federal grant money. And another main set of rules about the Historic Preservation Fund are outlined in the Historic Pre Preservation Fund Grant Manual. It's a mouthful, but it is produced by the National Park Service and it is designed specifically for these awards. Um, so when you think about Historic Preservation Fund as a general rule, eligible projects for the Historic Preservation Fund must directly relate to the identification, evaluation, or protection of historic or archaeological resources. All right, and more rules, right? There's always rules. So another requirement of the grant fund is that the grants must follow the set of requirements typically called the Secretary of the Interior Standards. An example of these requirements are that all projects must be overseen by somebody who meets a specific set of professional qualifications in an appropriate field. So for example, if you were applying for a grant to list your downtown on the National Register of Historic Places, it has to be, be, be prepared to hire a consultant who meets the professional qualifications either as a historian or an architectural historian. And these rules are, these standards are pretty, um, you know, not too difficult to meet, but they are specific and you have to follow those rules. Um, in order to find consultants that meet those standards, the State Historic Preservation Office maintains a list of consultants that meets the standard, but this list is not inclusive, nor is it a guarantee of the quality of work. It can be used as a tool if you're having find, difficulty finding a consultant to do it. Um, another example um, if, how, if you want to use the grant fund maybe to do design guidelines for your downtown district. You must know that the, the requirements, ugh, excuse me, the recommendations must comply with the Secretary of the Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties. Basically, there are no exceptions to these rules. Grant funded projects that do not follow these standards are not eligible for reimbursement. Another important aspect of the State Historic Preservation Fund grants projects is that they must further one of Missouri's statewide historic preservation planning goals. The goals for, are found in our sense of place, preserving Missouri's cultural resources, which is a comprehensive statewide historic preservation plan for Missouri. This document is available on the State Historic Preservation Office's website on that main front page. So you'll be able to find a link to it there. All right, now to the fun, or at least what I find the most fun part, it's examples of the types of pre preservation projects that are eligible for funding. One question that I've heard before is, we're certified, now what should we do? And typically I have two answers. I usually say training or planning. So let's talk about planning first. Think about planning as a way to continue the conversation with citizens of your community. Planning is asking them what kind of preservation program the community envisions and taking their feedback to develop goals, objectives, and strategies to achieve the community's vision. Planning gets your community to participate and buy into historic preservation and hopefully support it as well. This is a great way to integrate historic preservation into your city's larger preservation or your larger planning documents. Just, just think about that. Um, also, if you're curious about what a preservation plan might look like, here are two recent examples. One is from the city of Jefferson and the other is from the city of Independence. These documents are pretty different, but they give kind of a view of what that those planning documents might look like for your community if you had that vision or you were interested in that. Another type of project that can be valuable for your community's preservation journey is survey. Survey is extremely important component of any historic preservation program. It's actually so important that the federal government made it one of only five requirements for local governments in achieving certification in the CLG program. Survey helps the community to understand what resources exist in your community, why they are important, and it gives us all a tool to use in their protection. 
ideally certify or surveys are updated every 10 to 20 years because properties change over time. Maybe new windows, different siding, all kinds of changes could happen to buildings. So updating your surveys occasionally is also important. Also, just sharing something to think about. <laughs> Some buildings constructed as early as 1970 may now be considered historic properties. So, you know, you might have a new area of town that we all consider new that might be ready to be surveyed. So think about that as well. Um, maybe you have a really large area that is in need of survey. Consider the approach that the city of Washington used. They determined an area that needed to be surveyed, divided into manageable areas because it was far too big for one survey, and then used this map to help everyone understand the process. The city applied successfully for multiple grant rounds, and they were able to complete a survey of a really large area that was useful for them as a doc planning document. So, Another great type of project is the National Register nominations. So let's say your survey identified a property that are eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Grant funds can be used to list those districts or individual buildings. Properties that are listed on the National Register of Historic Places benefit us in several ways. Um, financial assistance, grant programs, and other incentives targeted at historic preservation routinely use the property's National Register status as a requirement for eligibility. Also, earlier and more effective planning in federal undertakings. Uh, historic, heritage tourism, you can market these buildings as that they are National Register listed. Also, the nominations provide a great history section that can help you tell the story of your community's development. And then finally, because we care, these are that's part of the reason we do these nominations, but it's important because it is important to us as well. Um, so if your community is interested in nominating a building that wasn't part of a recent survey project, then an eligibility assessment must be completed to ensure that your property is eligible for listing if you are going to apply for one of these grants. Um, the eligibility assessments are free. They're generally respond, you will re receive a response within 30 days. And it, this is a good assessment tool, even if you're not interested in a grant and you have a building that you're just curious about as a downtown, it's worth the time, in my opinion, to fill out the eligibility assessment and determine the status of that building and kind of help you plan, make a plan for your community's preservation as well. Another idea for preservation grants would be to develop or update your community's design guidelines. This is an image from the City of Independence's design guidelines. The city used the grant to update their existing design guidelines to make them more user friendly. They included more pictures, graphic images that represent the do's and do nots that they needed to have the, communicated to the community, but they also wanted to address more recent issues like solar panel placement and update their maps to make it more user friendly. So that's an idea as well if you have um, design guidelines that need to be updated or maybe your community doesn't have any. The other types of projects that really are great for historic preservation and for these grant programs are education and outreach. Many communities have used the Historic Preservation Fund to participate or provide educational opportunities. The grant is an excellent way to identify creative ways to teach historic preservation and take advantage of national expertise and to cultivate a strong support network for preservation as a whole. Here is an example of an outreach and education project way back from 2014, but it's still relevant. The City of Columbia identified the need to train local contractors in preservation methods. So they applied for a grant to host historic trades workshop where attendees learn how to physically repair historic windows, passively restore hardwood floors, and paint the exterior of wood buildings appropriately. <clears throat> While this isn't an old example, there were two communities that utilized this program during 2020 grant cycle, and they were able, able to do it even during the pandemic. So kudos to those communities. <laughs> then another example is this one, and it is an outreach project. It's the African American Heritage Trail. It's an interactive GIS map that helps share information about the locations of significant resources in Kansas City. The accompanying website allows for the project to continue by allowing oral history interviews to be uploaded and additional information to be added. Maybe a new area or new building they find out has a lot of significance and they're able to include it in this 
information. Um, and this project also included a num large number of public meetings and events to gain the input of the community and share kind of that value. So great project there. Also, if your community has a historic preservation commission, the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions has a training that can be specialized for your community. The program they offer is called CAMP and it's Commissioner Assistance Mentorship Program. The CAMP trainings are intensive trainings and they typically, the trainer will review the city's ordinance and provide information specific to your community. These are typically a day or maybe two days long and they are very, very helpful. Um, and there might be other programs similar to this, but this is just the one that I'm most familiar with. Also, another thing you can think about is in the past, the Historic Preservation Fund has awarded grants to communities to send their staff to the National Main Street Conference or the National Alliance of Preservation Commissioners Forum. The idea is that by adding, attending these conferences, staff would return with new ideas for maintaining a successful preservation program. And I know it's a little difficult this year to kind of make those plans, but I do think conferences will be coming back at some point. So something to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, also just keep in mind that any CLGs that might be out there that uh, every commissioner must attend at least one information or educational meeting annually. So keep that you know, in your mind as well. Another type of project that kind of can be overlooked is archaeology. It's important. So keep in mind, historic preservation fund grants can be used to fund some archaeological projects. Typically, these projects would include a survey, which is done only to the extent required to determine if the archaeological site is eligible for national or eligible for listing in the National Register of Historic Places. Full excavations would not be funded. Um, for example, here is one. Um, this is an example of an archaeological survey project. In 2015, Missouri State Parks conducted an archaeological survey of the Sappington Cemetery State Historic Site. The survey was not ground disturbing. Instead, they used ground penetrating radar and they used it to identify the location of grave sites so that it, the park staff would be in, able to ensure that they were protecting all the resources associated with this important site. Um, so that was just one way to do that. Um, so something to think about there. Finally, another project idea is the pre-construction or pre-development plans. Um, so these are early planning documents like a feasibility study, a historic maintenance or treatment plan specific to a building. These documents are used to evaluate the existing condition of a, of a building <laughs> and to develop and or prioritize a list of repairs. These are highly recommended for buildings that are planning a renovation project or a restoration project. And you need to have these documents to have a better understanding of the building as a whole. Let's say, for example, if you were to pursue just, you know, an example of why these are important. Let's say that the second story of your building, all the floors need to be refinished. And the, so you start to do that project. And as you're in the middle of the project, you discover that the reason the floors are damaged and need repair is that the guttering system is leaking throughout the entire building. So then all the gutters have to be replaced. But instead of doing that one project, it's sometimes better to look at the building as a whole so you can develop these important plans. Um, I will also note that these grant applications are only eligible for public buildings that are in public ownership. So um, that's something to keep in mind. They're not really for private residences or anything like that. Um, finally, if you have another idea of a project that you're thinking about that I didn't talk about, but it's something you have in mind, don't hesitate to reach out to me. We can discuss your project idea and I'd be happy to see if it could fit into the Historic Preservation Fund. Um, now we're gonna move on to other types of grant programs that are administered here by Missouri State Parks. Um, and generally we call these grants the outdoor recreation grants, but they make up of several different programs. The first one is the RTP, which is also known as the Recreational Trails Program. It is a federal pass-through grant, same as the Historic Preservation Fund grant, except this funding comes from the Federal Highway Administration. And most recently it's been funded from the Fixing America Surface Transportation Act or the FAST Act as it's known. Um, but it was started back in, in 1991 and it's been reinstated several ways. Um, the 
funding for this is actually comes from the Highway Trust Fund, which is a federal tax on fuel used for non-highway recreation. The, it provides funds to develop trails and trail related facilities for recreational purposes. So who can apply? Local and state governments, public and private schools, including colleges and universities, nonprofit organizations such as trail clubs, land trusts, youth groups, for-profit organizations and businesses can also apply, such as a private recreation facility that are open to the public. Um, and I think it's interesting here, if you'll notice, there's kayakers. Now, why would there be kayakers on a trail? Well, water trails are actually a thing as well. So um, there's those are other things to think about besides just what we think of as a regular trail for hiking and that sort of thing. There's other um, trails as well. So what kind of projects are eligible? Well, the construction of new recreational trails, the construction of trail side amenities, um, things like restrooms, drinking fountains, those sorts of things can be at trail heads. Maybe you need a parking lot for that trail and you need accessible parking to connect to that accessible trail. You can also pay for the acquisition of land or right of way easements and the re restoration or repair of existing trails or trail site amenities as well. And then the assessment of a trail condition, maybe for accessibility or maintenance. This is a great program and um, the funding for this program is an 80-20 matching. So the matching share is 80 percent well, i'm sorry the match i'm sorry 80 percent comes from the federal government and 20 percent in local match so that is the and the maximum amount of money that you can apply for is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. so maybe your community has a residential area and you could utilize this to connect a recreational trail from your downtown to maybe that outlying subdivision um, it might be an idea for that there's other options as well but that's just an idea to think about. The next program I'm going to talk about is the Land and Water Conservation Fund. So this program, interestingly, is thought of as the sister program to the Historic Preservation Fund. They have a lot of similarities. Um, this fund was created in 1965, and it created the Land and Water Conservation Fund Act. It is administered at the federal level by the National Park Service and here at the state level by the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, Missouri State Parks. Division and it is funded primarily through lease revenue from offshore oil and gas drilling, similar again to the Historic Preservation Fund grants. Um, the funds provide for acquisition and development of public outdoor recreation facilities. Uh, so, who can apply? This grant, you can also, local and state governments can apply, public school districts, and public universities. So what can you fund for it? Or what can you use to pay for with this grant, the Land and Water Conservation Fund? This is a matching share grant with 50% coming from the federal partner and 50% in local match. Again, the maximum request amount is $250,000. And it can pay for things like playgrounds, ball fields, swimming pools or splash pads, archery or shooting ranges, camping facilities, picnic areas, golf course, boating and fishing facilities, trails, and also just passive areas, green spaces. Um, so maybe your community has that vacant lot that you, maybe a pocket park is what has been tossed around. This program could help you potentially develop a pocket park for your community, or maybe that park is already um, you have another park nearby that um, needs some restoration or renovations, this might also be the program for you. Um, the other thing to think about, though, when you're thinking about this grant program is that it is, um, it maintains a, all properties must be maintained in perpetuity for public use. So that means that the land is set aside forever for outdoor recreation purposes. So if you wanted to build a community shelter or a community building on a park, you would have to do some difficult things to think about. So um, think about this program, um, you know, but also it's a really good program, but also keep that in mind as you're thinking of it, of that perpetuity requirement. Um, the final program that I'm going to talk about today is the Outdoor Recreation Legacy Partnership Program. And it, this grant program is a complement to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It is for communities that are located within urbanized areas as defined in the Census Bureau as populations of 50,000 or more residents. And this has a very good complement to the Land and Water Conservation Fund. The, the goal of this grant program though is focused on urban areas. And 
it's a basically they're trying to find new ways to highlight outdoor play in areas with great need and support the creation or significant renovation of state or locally owned parks and other outdoor recreation spaces in urban areas. So who can apply for this one? Um, it is state agencies, local governments, cities, counties, and special purpose districts, such as park districts. The requests are a minimum of $300,000 up to $5 million. So, and it is a 50-50 matching share grant. And this grant program I will highlight is open for applications. They are due by August 10th. So you have a little over a month to get your application together. And if you wanna learn more about that program, our website is listed there, but you could also um, email us and I'd be happy to share some more information about this program if it's something you're interested in. So, and one more thing I wanna highlight is the Historic Preservation Fund competitive grant programs. These are fan funds directly from the National Park Service. And these, each one is just a little bit different, but they are offered um, through the National Park Service. So they all have a different requirement and level of funding and purpose. Um, each specific information about each grant program is available on the NPS website, but I'm just gonna list them all off so you can kind of think about those. Um, so one is the African-American Civil Rights Grants disaster recovery grants. These are often in hurricane areas um, or significant storm areas. Um, historically black colleges and universities. The history of equal rights grant or the HER grants. The Paul Brune historic revitalization, revitalization grant program. Save America's treasures, tribal heritage grants and underrepresented community grants. So there are a large variety of grants that are available available specifically from the National Park Service if you're looking for a different idea in your community. Finally, I saw this historic preservation fun fact, I don't know, somewhere on social media, I can't remember exactly, but it always makes me laugh. Apparently, this is the clock tower lady from Back to the Future. And this is the first instance of a preservationist in a movie. And I haven't done my own research to find out if this is true, but I do love this graphic. So the next time you're thinking about how to fund a preservation project in your community, consider contacting me and we can discuss your project and see if you're a good fit for the Historic Preservation Fund or your project is. Um, and also keep an eye out for an announcement coming soon about applications for the next round of Historic Preservation Fund grant funding. So, and here is my contact information if you have any questions. I think we can go ahead and open it up for questions if you're ready. Thanks, Allison. A lot of great information. We'll leave your screen up there just for a little bit so people sure. can, can grab your contact information. Okay. I have a couple questions that have already come in. Feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A section um, of your um, control panel. I'll curate through those and, and ask them of, of Allison. Uh, the first one is, um, it, it's my own interest before uh, we get to the, the general questions. You sure. mentioned Department of Natural Resources, State Park, State Historic Preservation Office. How does all that work together? And and because uh, you're all part of one entity, right? We are. We are technically all part of one group, but we all have different programs that work together. So here in Missouri, the Division of State Parks is divided into different programs and the State Historic Preservation Office is a separate program and the grants management section is a little bit different. So currently the grants management section handles all of the outgoing and incoming grants for Missouri State Parks. So I'm a former State Historic Preservation Office staff member. So I'm uniquely situated here in this position. So okay. Great. yeah. It's, it's that whole culture of departments and divisions and offices and, and all that, that state government stuff. But it, it all right. falls under Missouri State Parks, right? That's right. All within DNR. And, you know, one of the phrase we always have is we are one DNR. And so we all kind of are working together to protect cultural and natural resources here in the state. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So first question, how does SHPO provide guidance or advice on architectural surveying? Ooh, that's a good question. So the website does have um, some directions on how to fill out an application, but I think that you could contact the State Historic Preservation Office in the natural, um, National Register and Survey section, and they would be able to provide you with some specific guidance on what you are looking for for your survey area and maybe help you figure out exactly what you need there. So that group would be the one most willing and most able to help with that, but there are instructions and information on our website to help with that, um, completing the forms, but there's probably other questions you might have as well. 
Great. And I have always found and heard that the SHPO office, the State Historic Preservation Office, is very helpful when it comes to any of your questions or needing guidance. Um, so what is generally the process to get a property listed on the National Register? Okay, so the National Register of Historic Places is the honorific list here in the state of, or in the nation for historic properties. And the first step generally we recommend is to do an eligibility assessment. And then from there, you'll have a better idea of how your property is eligible. And then you can write a nomination. And once the State Historic Preservation Office has received a nomination, they review it and when it's ready, it's scheduled for the Missouri Advisory Council for, on Historic Preservation's board meeting. Those happen three or four times a year, um, just depending. And then that once it is presented to that body, they will vote on it. And then from there, assuming it is successful, it will then go to the National Park Service where they review it and make the final determination. And generally that process takes anywhere from six months to a year um, after the draft is successfully completed. So it's a little bit of a process, but it is an important process. A couple follow-up questions. Sure. Where do you sure. go to assess the eligibility assessment? Access, I'm sorry, where do you go oh. to access the eligibility assessment? So it is on the Missouri um, Department of, it's on the Missouri State um, Wow, the State Historic Preservation Office's website. And on the right-hand side, I do believe it says assessing eligibility and it's right there on one of those, it's on their main website there. So you can find okay. that information there and there's a form to fill out. Um, it's a front and back, but you can add additional photos and other information. And then the instructions on how to submit it to the office are included there as well. Okay. Do you, can an, an individual property owner do the nom, do the, uh, the nomination, the application? Uh, do you need a consultant? Um, if how, you're, how do if you you're, use, if you're using a grant fund, you do have to have a consultant that specializes in this type of work. But if you're doing it just on your own, um, you may do it on your own. Any, there's nothing stopping a private citizen from doing this work. Um, it might take some time, but it is definitely something that can be done. Okay, great. Yeah. And you mentioned planning documents. How do yes. you go about putting together a historic preservation plan? That's a good question. Um, it's not something that I specialize in specifically, but I think you would really want to look around at the different planning documents that are out there. You might wanna hire a consultant that specializes in that type of work, and there are consultants that do it. But I think a lot of it is engaging your community and determining what everyone wants in a planning document. So it's generally gonna give you an idea of what you want to do for your community over time. So, you know, they range in different things. Um, one of the suggestions I've seen is create a historic context for your community so that you have an idea of the full history and an, an inclusive history of your community um, might be something that's a goal of your preservation plan. Um, another item is maybe you want to survey that area that's never been looked at before. So that would be another um, thing that you would gather your community together and talk about what it is that you want to do to understand preservation in your community. Okay. Um, how many preservation grants are awarded per year? It varies depending on the amount of application requests we get and the amount of funding we receive from the federal government. I believe the most we've done in a year recently is about 18 and as few as 10. So it kind of varies depending on the year. Okay. Um, I just shared the Missouri State Parks National Register of Historic Places piece that we just talked about. Thank you. Um, if you're not a CLG, you can still apply for preservation grants, correct? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. So they are, we are eligible applicants for the Historic Preservation Fund are, of course, certified local governments. But in addition to that, there are any county governmental entity, any municipal government, um, local government, they are all eligible. And then we also will accept applications from nonprofits with a historic preservation mission. Okay. Um, what about, and this question just came in, uh, CID, a Community Improvement District, are they eligible? That's a great question. I would have to look at that a little bit closer. Okay. Um, They're considered a political subdivision. I do know that. Um, okay. And do work typically on in the public realm on, on public property. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. We have quite a few 
CIDs or community improvement districts in our, our main street downtowns uh, that's used as an additional funding source. And so that's a that's a really good question. That is a good, yeah, I'd ha I'm going to have to dig a little deeper on that one. I just, okay. right off the cuff, I don't have an answer, but I can look it up. And okay. e if you email me that, I can follow up to that as well. Great, great. Um, how, who can apply for the recreational transformation transportation plan? The recreational trails, I'm going to go back to it just so I've got it in front of me. I don't know it right off the cuff. Uh, so the recreational trails, it's local and state governments. And there is also public and private schools, colleges and universities, not-for-profit organizations, and for-profit organizations. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. When will the Historic Preservation Fund grants be announced for this year? That is a great question. We hope soon. We hope soon. Um, we are very hopeful that they will come out very soon. Um, we're just waiting on a few things from the federal partner. Okay. Do you know much about the National Trust's um, grants that they have? I unfortunately do not know a lot about those. Um, okay. I've heard great things about them, but I don't I don't have an intimate knowledge of all of that. Okay. Their programs. You might have to ask our um, Caitlin Brotherton in our office to talk because there is a uh, uh, evidently, there was some money given that brings priority to Missouri and Kansas grants um, through a, a, a donation to the National Trust, and uh, so we may have to we may need to share that information with folks as as we as we move through that. It's a great opportunity. Oh yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah, you have to look a little bit more. I'll give folks a, another minute or two to put in some questions. And actually, Allison, if you'll stop sharing. You bet. I need to bring my screen back up, but continue to type in your questions while we make this transition here. All right, um, we just have a few more minutes for questions. So feel free to, to keep typing away. Um, I don't think I have any more. Um, All right. I, I do, this is a, a, a question because I know the answer, but which community has used um, historic preservation grants the most? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't done the research on that. I don't actually know. It, it um, used to be Excelsior Springs. You know, I that might be, that might be the case. I, I, need, I need to run some numbers on that for sure. Um, but the program has existed for 50 years. There's been a long history. So, and I know Excelsior Springs was an early develop, you know, early adopter right. of preservation. So that would not surprise me. Yeah, they've at all. done, they've done uh, um, several, uh, preservation plans. They've done uh, surveys. Uh, they did the, the building um, assessment for the Hall of Waters. Uh, yes. I know that they, uh, they're very active in, in that. Our, our uh, Historic Preservation Commission is very active in, in what Right. And is it, do they have a Save America's Treasure Grant right now? Well, it's funny you mention that because somebody just asked that question. Can you speak a little more about the Save America's Treasure Grant? So, yeah, of course. So the Save America Treasures grant is a grant from the federal government specifically. So I don't really play a role in that grant process, but it is for properties that are listed on the National Register at the national level of significance, which um, there's different levels of significance, but they're all the same as listing. Um, that national level low is a little bit harder to achieve, or the building has to be a historic national historical landmark, which again, it's elevating that to something that is specifically important to our nation's history. Mm -hmm. And those grants are rather large in size. And I believe the National Park Service has the, a really cool graphic where they show all the distribution of Save America Treasures grants across the United States. Um, so it is a really great program. Um, and I, I don't remember exactly how much the Hall of Waters received in a grant, but it's going to be, it's a sizable grant program um, yeah. for those national treasures. So great, great. Yeah. Um, had several folks mention the you other know, small um, historic preservation groups are trying to uh, gain information about grants and, and preserving their town, I would send them to the State Historic Preservation Office website to learn more. Um, also people trying to, um, you know, fill up their Historic Preservation Commissions, you know, they, they um, uh, getting the right folks on those boards and education. And you mentioned uh, using those grant funds for educational and outreach type things. Those are good, good opportunities. Absolutely. Um, one last question. 
Uh, oh, two last questions regarding uh, the cemetery project. Was it only eligible because it was a historic site or could other cemeteries apply for the survey? So surveying of your cemetery could be done. Um, they were, I believe, in the process of determining what the boundaries of that cemetery were. So I think it had been determined that it had significance and that it was potentially eligible. So that was in order to determine where, how far the burials went. And so determining where those boundaries were was part of that grant process. So it was helping to figure out its eligibility. Um, so I think the eligibility has to be part of the puzzle um, for surveying it. I mean, it is possible to utilize the grant funding for just an evaluation of your cemetery. So, you know, again, call me and we can talk about it and see if it's something that, you know, is would fit into that realm. Dive a little deeper into that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Are communities allowed to pass a tax toward their portion of the grant funds? Um, I guess that, let me let me ask it in a different way. If, okay. If we, let's say we have a transportation sales tax. Can we use that as our match on the uh, the trails grant? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 So you can use current uh, you can use tax proceeds for your portion if need be. I I don't see why not. I do believe many communities have parks and recreation tax that they use right. for the land and water conservation fund. So I do think that's right. Um, I'd have. I mean, I, I would recommend looking through the rules, but I do believe that would, would not be a problem. Okay, okay. And when is the next training gonna be available for preservation commissioners through SHPO? That is a great question. I don't have an answer for it. I do believe that the State Historic Preservation Office is working on um, a forum, a CLG forum, but I don't have information about it specifically. Okay, great, awesome. Well, Allison, I want to thank you. Uh, lots yes. of great questions, lots of great information. Um, and I will, I'll throw in one more commercial for Excelsior Springs. We did use the one grant for a splash pad here in Excelsior Springs that we are almost finished with. So Yay! Uh, the Lane and Water Conservation. Yep, yeah. utilize those grant opportunities that are out there to bring wonderful things to your communities, um, whether it's downtown or community-wide, because they all benefit the community. So Allison, thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Yep. I really appreciate it. And thank second. you all for I'm participating. Do... Great. Thank you. Um, yep. we're, we are moving this Mornings on Main platform to quarterly. You know, we, we did this weekly during the height of COVID to bring information to our Main Street programs and communities across the state. Then we moved it to monthly. And now we're going to move it to quarterly. So our next one will be September 1st. And uh, we haven't quite settled on our topic yet, so we'll keep you uh, posted, but there will be a survey. You will receive an email after this webinar. Uh, it should be tomorrow um, saying thank you for attending and also will be a link to the video. So those of you that asked, is this gonna be shared afterwards? Uh, you'll have access to the video um, of the whole presentation uh, and those will be available uh, tomorrow. That'll be sent out in that email, but there's also a quick survey. Um, where we asked you just some simple questions about the survey, provide us a little feedback, but we do also ask for uh, topic suggestions. So please feel free to, to give us some of those uh, to help us as we plan moving forward. And as always, these are free and open to anybody uh, across the state. And we usually have folks from other states that attend too. So welcome. Um, thank you all. Hope you guys had a, a great 4th of July. Allison, again, thank you. You guys all have a great day. Talk to you later.